Hello, this is Harvey Ambrose, and I am preaching this message on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio station, broadcasting out of Monrovia, Liberia. And we are continuing in our study of the book of Genesis, and are in chapter 26, but as a preliminary passage, uh, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Matthew 5, verse 9, which reads, Blessed are, the pe- Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And then turning to Genesis chapter 26, I'll begin reading in verse 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence, and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. For he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there, And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing that ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there now Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made a feast uh, for them, and they did eat and drink, and they rose up betimes in the morning, and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beer Sheba unto this day. So, uh, last week, uh, we told a little bit about how uh, Isaac, uh, having, because of a famine in the land of Canaan, where he was living, uh, the Lord had told him to stay in Canaan, and that he'd be with him, and, uh, and he was dwelling uh, amongst, uh, well, in a place where the Lord told him to go, which was in the land of the Philistines. Uh, and the title for their king is Abimelech. And so the, the king of the Philistines, Abimelech, uh, of the Philistines, uh, you know, it took him into his, uh, into his lands and told him he could go where he wanted to go. There had been, a, uh, there'd been some consternation because of uh, his wife, Rebecca, how the Philistines wanted her, but he had told them that he that she was his sister, and we won't go through that again, but it turned out okay, in so much that Abimelech the king uh, 
uh, you know, made an edict throughout his uh, lands that he ruled that no one should hurt Isaac or his wife. And they were to live in peace there. But the problem became that Isaac had, through the blessings of God, uh, become very wealthy and well fed. He had uh, he had a hundred percent or a hundred fold. That, uh, that's a hundred times uh, produce during a famine, which obviously just doesn't happen unless God steps into nature and overturns the laws that He has set in there for the sake of one of His beloved. And that's what had happened to Isaac. God was with him, and so Isaac prospered. And I think it's important to understand at this time, we speak of the Philistines and we speak of Isaac. We really haven't talked much about uh, the profound difference that lies between them. It's not that Isaac, you know, was in any way, in and of himself, particularly better uh, than his neighbors, the Philistines. Uh, not, not by any, I'm not saying he was not a virtuous man. I'm saying that all men are sinners and all men deserve judgment from God in, you know, because of their sin. Nevertheless, God has made provision for any sinner. That's you and me and, and all people whereby they can seek and find forgiveness from him. And in that forgiveness, God makes a change within us, in our spirit, the, the essential part of our nature. Our flesh remains flesh, but, but he adjusts the desires of our heart. When he forgives us of sin, he changes us and causes us to be different from what we were and from what all the unregenerate, the unsaved people of the earth are. So that Isaac, alone amongst these people, the Philistines, and living amongst them, uh, worshipped God now. He was not uh, a worshiper of, of idols. He was not a pagan like these Philistines were. They had many gods and they worshipped them. And they trusted in them, I guess, to bring food in season, to forestall famine or drought or any, any pestilence or disease. Just like people do today, they turn to their gods. Nowadays, it's gods of science. Some who would think that even though science certainly has saved my life uh, in surgical operations, and the, but I don't, I don't rely upon that, nor am I particularly concerned as to whether or not my life is saved by science or, or by anyone. Because having been saved inwardly, what happens outwardly to my body becomes a fairly trivial thing, as it is with all truly saved people. Because to die in this world simply means that we go to be with the Lord which is far better. It would be that way with Isaac. He's living in the world, in the world of unregenerate people, by and large, people who have not been saved, people who don't worship the true and living God. And, and it's as though he's one of them, but, you know, and, and the world might mistake us for being like itself, and we might sometimes in ourselves forget who we are and act like someone from the world. But it's when trouble comes that the difference between the people of God and the people of the world is made manifest or, or clear. Now, in the previous chapter, we had learned that God had told uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, that the twins that were in her womb, who were struggling, represented two nations, but also two manner of people. And that, uh, and I explained to you that the, the two manner of people that it was describing is, uh, one would be those whom God has delivered from their sins, 
through forgiveness paid for by the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ paying the price for our sins in his own body on the cross. Those who had sought out that forgiveness of sins, those who to this day seek that out and seek it from God until they are forgiven by God and he has assured them of that, that is the one type of person. And all those who have not thus sought out and found the forgiveness of sins and, and received it directly at the hand of the living God, they are the other type of person. Those two types, those two manners of mankind live today as they has always lived in this world as neighbors. They're all around us and we're all around about them. Uh, the, the, the lost manner of people greatly outnumber the saved. Outwardly, they look like the saved. And in many ways, they act like the saved. Uh, there's, you can't just look at someone and spot whether or not they are saved. Oh, they may say they're saved. They may act saved. They may be saved. But see, the Bible teaches that we can only look on the outside appearance. But it's God that looks on the heart. So I can look at people today and I... You know, I can look at their actions as well as anyone else can. I, I would like to think by what I see that someone's saved, but I don't know that because I can't, I can't look into their spirit to find out whether or not they are someone whose sins have been forgiven in Christ, who have been given eternal life in this world and the world to come, who will one day be partakers of that resurrection unto life in which they will have an eternally incorruptible body and live in an eternal realm that will never perish. I can't look at that. I don't know that. I know that truly about no one other than myself because I can't look in other people's hearts, but I am aware uh, of what God did in mine. So I know that sounds like it's away from our text, but what we see here is a fulfillment of what God had told Abraham about his offspring. He said, your descendants are going to live in a land that is not their own and that they would be uh, afflicted by the people of that land for 400 years. And uh, after 400 years, they would come into a land, they'd come out of the land that belonged to other people and into a land that was that God had made to be their own. Now, some people take that meaning Egypt only, but it's not true. Even while they dwelt in Canaan, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their children lived in Canaan, which was the possession of the Canaanites at the time that they lived there. It was a land not their own. And even though they made treaties with these people, even though they were neighbors to these people and did no harm to their neighbors, yet they were not uh, of that place. They were strangers there. Even according to Abraham, he says, I'm a stranger in your land. I'm a, I'm a wanderer here. And so it is to this day with the people of God, even though we may maintain that we may own a piece of ground and live on it. We may, we may be residents of, of a nation. Uh, we have a passport from that nation. And we, uh, to all appearances and, and for, you know, legal reasons or whatever, we are like everyone else. We are of or a member of some kingdom or nation of this earth. And that's as far as men can see and tell. But there lies within the people of God a distinction. And one of those distinctions is what we read out in Matthew chapter 5, which Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. In, five, in chapter 5, verse 9, where I read, Blessed, and he means blessed 
of God himself, made blessed by God, are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. All the people who have sought out the Lord God in prayer and in supplication until such time as God forgave their sins and brought righteousness into their heart and gave them eternal life, they are the children of God, and they become, at that time, peacemakers. I grew up a soldier. I was an army officer. I lamented that I had never been in battle. I wanted to go. I volunteered to go. Oftentimes, I almost went, but yet, somehow, God prevented, I guess, even though I was lost. He, it just never happened for me. After I was saved, I became very glad that I had not had to endure uh, war. But it's not just war between nations in a, in a violent way or even a civil war within a nation where, you know, where some of the, the terrible things of a, a lack of peace are made manifest, but it's also in our daily lives, particularly during times of economic or or physical illness, any type of uh, nationwide uh, hard times, I guess is the best way to put it, because it comes from different things. A war can bring hard times. A famine can bring hard times. A, a disease can bring hard times. I don't need to tell that to you who live in Libya, uh, Liberia, because, because that has happened there. You have, many of you within your lifetime, lived through, through civil war and through famine and through a plague. And, uh, and I think about you often in the context of, of your history and life. And, and it bothers me that, uh, that those things have happened to you. It bothers me that those things are coming upon my country. It's, it's just as clear as it can be that, that our country here in America, we have, we have brought the wrath of God upon ourselves. Right now, it looks like everything's wonderful. But there's coming a time, I think very shortly, where it will not be wonderful. And I think that's already starting to happen. And uh, woe be unto us for our sins. So, as I started to say, during these hard times on earth is when the two different manner of people began to become manifest uh, as distinguished from the neighbors within whom and with whom they live. So as, uh, you know, Abimelech is, I should say, as Isaac began to wax great, in other words, here in a famine, he was getting rich and powerful and added to his number many servants and household members and, and, and he had crops that brought forth a hundredfold while everybody else was starving and sick and all that. Uh, they grew jealous of him. It says that they did. They envied him. So they sent him away. And then we pick up the narrative in verse 17 where it says, and, and when they sent him away, I just departed. Isaac did not argue with them. There's neighbors. He was, he was only there because they allowed it. And he, uh, he's a peacemaker. And as you read through what happens here, as I read it to you, uh, he, at every turn, he avoided conflict with the people of this world, with that other manner of people, the ones that worshiped idols, the ones that did not know the Lord God living in their hearts because he wasn't living there because they had not been born again, born of God, children of God. They were children of this world and he, he doubtless had some pity on them as we all do. Those of us who are saved, we look upon those who were lost and remember what we were and how that it's only by God's grace that we've been changed, and how it's only by a lack of that, or a lack of searching for that, that every lost person is, is not our brother. They would be. 
if they were to turn to God with all their heart and receive from God what we have received. So Isaac, not trying to be contentious in any way, and he had not been contentious. Uh, he did exactly what, what the, uh, the Abimelech, the king, had told him to do. He stayed. But Abimelech had no idea that he was going to prosper like he did. And the people within his realm were going to become envious of Isaac. So when he was told to leave, he left. He departed. He pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And as he dwelt, he, he needed water. After all, there was a drought which had brought about a famine. He needed water, so he had to dig wells. And he went to the wells where his father Abraham had dug them in years past. But when Abraham died, the Philistines, for insane reasons, nothing, there is no excuse for filling in a dug well that was producing water in an arid desert land. It's insane. The lost do insane things. Currently, the lost have invented uh, all types of nonsense about how mankind controls the climate of the world and how we're set to make sure that the world's climate doesn't change anymore. Well, it was foolish then, and it's foolish now. The Lord has put humanity in this world. We're not an interloper here. We're part of his creation, and he has given us a, 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 a charge all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told to, to subdue the land, to, to exercise dominion upon it. We are, to, we are to tame it. We are to take the resources that are there and use them for our benefit and for the benefit of our progeny, for our race, the human race, so that we can live in, a, in an untamed world. We are to dig wells. We are to find sources of energy so we can have heating and cooling and refrigeration and electricity and, and all the things that make life less hard and more secure. And when that's done, if we go and undo what's been done by former generations, it is insanity. And that's all, that's a, it, it is pure insanity. And yet that's what they do. That's what they do because they get jealous of something. Who knows what it is now? Back then they were jealous of Isaac's prosperity. They covered up Abraham's wells. So Isaac dug them back. And when he dug them back, as they were doing, one of the wells sprang water. Well, that's called an artesian well to this day. And it just means that there's water pressure down there that will cause the water to rise up in the well sometimes even near the top or to overflowing. I mean, it's, it's good water, it's not stagnant, it's continuously replenished from down deep in the earth. Great water. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, so named because it had artesian wells like Memphis, Egypt did. And we had some of the best water on earth. This was such a spring. The Bible speaks of such things as being living water living water. It's though it, it has a life of its own. It, it springs up. And he says that those of us who are saved have within us a salvation that is like the, and, and actually flows from the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and, and life continuously wells up from the hearts, the spirits within the bodies of those who are saved such that there's a distinction between us. We're a different manner of people. I tell you, one of the things that should spring up from us is peacemaking. And that's what this one is about. So they dug these wells and they found uh, one that they redig that Abraham had dug and it had this, this, this artesian well. And it says that the herdmen of Gerar uh, noticed it and they strove, they contended. And so the, the word uh, that they call Isik, it means to, to contend or to strive, to, to have a fight. The water is ours, they said. And so Isaac called it Isak because they strove with him. It, it, the finding of the water, even though they wanted him to leave and he left, when they saw that he'd gone someplace and redug 
a well that Abraham had dug and they had covered up, they were jealous because, well, there's water. Well, you know, why didn't they think to go dig those wells themselves? It's an odd thing. I can't understand how people, I can't understand it. But they didn't. But when Isaac dug them again, they were jealous of the water, so they wanted it. Of course, they needed it. It was a famine going on. They needed the water. And so they, they fought to have it. But rather than returning their strife and their contention, he just called it what it was, his contention. And he left it behind him. And he went on somewhere else. He trusted that God, who had told him to remain in that place, would provide for him. That's what a peacemaker does. He doesn't fight back. Even if he's in the right, he does not fight back. And then he says, uh, and they digged another well. And they strove for that one too. And he called the name of it Sitna. And Sitna means hatred. See, the reason they strove, according to Isaac, was they hated them. And, they, and, and he says so much just in a few more verses. You, you hate me. Why have you come to me if you hate me? You, you, your hatred towards me, he didn't say that it was because of envy, but it, it's logical that because it says they envy him, that the envy turned to hatred, as it so often does. These are just human traits. This is how we live in a world. I know it seems maybe boring, but it's interesting for me to think how people have never really changed. Oh, the 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 academics and all that of the world try to pretend that we are so advanced over the other cultures. My friends, we are not. If anything, we have declined. We certainly have declined morally speaking. And I think even intellectually. Now we have technology and, and years of history that we rely upon so that we have a better state of technology. But the, the pattern of thinking of human minds, I think, has descended greatly uh, from the days of, of Archimedes and Julius Caesar and, and some of the, the truly bright bulbs of the past. But anyway, hatred is what he called that. That's well, so why he removes again. And he digged another well. And they did not strive over that well. They left him alone for whatever reason. And he called the name of that. It's interesting that he names the wells. Um, and I think that's, it's kind of like a memorial. So Isaac trusted in God, and God kept providing him water where he dug wells. And so he thought it's right to memorialize uh, the grace and favor of God by giving a name to the place such that it would be remembered you know, for what it was. So here they dug one and he called it Rehoboth because it says for the Lord hath made room and that's what it means a, a roomy place. So God since they were no longer striving over they didn't strive over that well Isaac had a well just where he needed it and God had provided it that there would be water there when they dug down. And he says so he's made room for us. They're not bothering us here. And so he went up from thence, and he, he camped again. It's not like he abandoned the well. He, he's using the wells as he goes along, and he can go back and forth to them. And it says uh, he went up from there to, to Beersheba, what is now called Beersheba. It was not called that then. He, he named it that after the well came up. And it says, and the Lord appeared unto him that same night. So as you're making peace uh, with people, the Lord is noticing what you're doing. When you act to your neighbors like you ought to act, the Lord takes notice of that in a favorable way. When you act towards your neighbor as you ought not to act, the Lord notices that too, but in the way of judgment and punishment. But here, I think it's in connection with Isaac's persistent uh, avoidance of conflict, even with neighbors who were conflicting with him. And he said he called the name of the place Beersheba and the Lord, or he went to Beersheba and the Lord appeared unto him that same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Notice, 
Jesus uses passages like this to prove to Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection that there is a resurrection. That the dead who die bodily in this world go on to live either in, in Sheol or hell or in the paradise of God. When he says to the Abraham or to the Sadducees, he says, the Bible says, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He's not a God then of the dead, but the living. He would have said, I was the God of Abraham, your father, had Abraham ceased to exist. But, God, but Abraham had not ceased to exist. His body had died and was buried. But God gathered his spirit to himself. Abraham was living with God. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. And so he's identifying himself and he says, fear not, I'm with thee. I will bless thee. I'll multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake, because I loved your father so much and he was a good and faithful servant to me. I'm going to bless you. That's uh, something for those of us who are parents to think about. If we can live right, Maybe the Lord will bless our offspring because of God's regard for us. And so it says that um, Isaac built an altar there and he called upon the name. It means he worshiped God there and he pitched his tent. In other words, he made sacrifice there and he would worship there and he, and he pitched his tent. You know, there, there were multiple tents, but what he means is he encamped there and dwelt there even though he's a nomad and he goes about with his flocks and, and all that, nevertheless, he stays in places for a long period of time and, and people had ceased to strive with him and he had found uh, one well. Now he's digging another and it says, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. So they were digging a well in Beersheba, what would soon be named Beersheba. And while they're doing that, it says Abimelech went to him. So now the king of the Philistines comes from Gerar and he brings with him uh, his, uh, one of his friends and the chief captain of his army and Isaac sees him coming and he says, why have you come to see me? Seeing that you hate me and you've sent me away from you, which is exactly true. That's why he called the well hatred. And he had been sent away from them and no, he, you know, they had told him, you get out of here. We don't want you around because they had envied him. And so all Isaac is doing is just pointing out the known obvious thing. Why are you here now? Because, I mean, you hate me. You've asked me to leave. I've left. And why are you here? And they answered him. He said, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. So see, they've noticed that there is a difference between him and the other people living in that land. They could not have told it just looking at his flesh and the flesh of his wife and servants. They, they couldn't told that God had made a distinction because they were just like everybody else. But when hard times came, God preserved them in, in such a manner that it could not escape the notice of his neighbors. Why is it that everywhere this man goes, crops come up, there's plenty of water, people prosper, life is all around him, when all we have is, is poverty and death and sickness. So God uses troubled times to bring sinners to repentance. What is it that makes Isaac different? Whatever that is, that's what we need. And hopefully some will seek God and, and, and receive in their hearts the same thing that was in Isaac's and is in mine, which is the Spirit of God, from having been born again of His Spirit on account of Christ having paid the price of our sins. So he says, we... In other words, we saw certainly mean, we certainly noticed that God was with you. Even though they worshiped false gods, they knew he worshiped a God that they didn't worship. They may have been 
cutting themselves with stones and sacrificing their children and who knows what all, I mean, there's, there's all kind of accounts where they did these things, the false gods. They, they burned their children in the fire to bring about some blessing from God during times of trouble. Who knows what they had done? It had not worked. That's what we know. And they noticed that with Isaac, God was blessing him abundantly. This God they didn't know was blessing Isaac. We've certainly noticed. And we said, so they discussed this, let's have an oath betwixt this man and the God he worships and, and ourselves. Let's make a covenant with you. In other words, they were afraid because Isaac had become so much more powerful through the blessings of God, both in people and in wealth and in health, food, all necessary things. They were afraid that they knew that they had not treated him right. And, uh, you know, at first they coveted his wife. Well, then they stopped that, but then they envied his, his prosperity. And then they began to fight with him over the wells. But they act as though none of that has happened. Since we didn't kill you, and since we didn't rape your wife, well, so we really haven't done anything bad to you, is what they say. Let's make a covenant with you because uh, don't, we don't want you to hurt us. You know, so that thou wilt do us no hurt. Just like we have not touched thee. I guess they mean we haven't taken your life. And as we have done unto thee nothing but good. Well, what about when they sent him away into the wilderness and said, don't live with us? Or when they came and took the wells after he had uncovered the wells that Abraham, his father, had digged. And they strove with him and hated him. These things that, that, that Abimelech is saying are lies. He says, we haven't hurt you. We've done nothing to you. Nothing but good things, you know, and and we sent you away in peace. No, they sent him away in, in enmity and in hatred. He says, and now thou art the blessed of the Lord. Now, Isaac was more powerful. He could have taken these three emissaries from the Philistines and, and taken their heads off if he had wanted to. He could, have, he could have said, you know what, you're lying to me. And you know good well you are because I was there when you sent us away into the wilderness. I was there when your herdsmen attacked us over these wells that we had dug, which had belonged to my father Abraham in the past, and, and you covered up. He could, have, he could have said all those things because they would have been true, and it would have rebuked these people, but it would not have promoted peace. And Isaac was a peaceable man. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, you should ask yourself, <coughs> what lies in your heart with respect to violence toward your neighbor or no violence regardless of the, uh, of the circumstance which may prompt you to violence. In other words, uh, how bad does someone have to treat you before you are going to respond in kind towards them? It could just be older age on my part, but I'll tell you something. When the Lord saved me, he took the hatred out of me. He also took away any desire well, most desire. The, the sins of the flesh are hard, hard to put down. But I will say certainly most desire to even fight for my own way, for my own benefit. I look upon those who are lost and, and I, I was lost for so long. I remember what it was like and I, and I have a pity for people that don't know God. And I also know that of my my sojourn here in this world, wherever I have to live, and I've, I've moved so many times I can't keep track of them anymore. Uh, I'm just a stranger in a world of, of people who are not, not like me. And I know why they're not like me. And I preach to them so that 
by the grace of God, they might be, by God, made like me. Not that I'm a great person, but that God does great things to people who have sought him out in repentance and prayer until God has heard their prayer and saved them from all their troubles. That's what I would have happen to you. That's what you would have happen to people too if, if the Lord has saved you. And the, and the very thought of violence against another person just seems to evaporate after you've been saved. And, and you want nothing but good. You know that they're only here for a short time. They're going to die just like you are. And you want, you want them to be saved. You don't want them to die in their sins. Ask yourself if you're a peacemaker. Or if when someone insults you, you become enraged at that. Or you might seek their harm or payback somehow. Ask if that's what's in your heart. Because if hatred of your neighbor or desire for vengeance against them rules your heart, then Jesus could not say of you that you're blessed of God because you're a peacemaker. Therefore, he would not say of you that you are called the children of God. See, the one thing goes with the other. If you're a peacemaker, it's because of the blessings of God. And he calls you what you are, a child of God. The children of God are made by God to be peaceable with all men. Oh, there's many out there that say to the children of God that are not peaceable at all. Some of them are most violent, and there are violent religions out there. But the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who takes people from this world, uh, leaving their dead bodies, but takes their spirits to be with him, he, he's a living God, and he sows peace and peaceable coexistence within the hearts of his people. So Isaac... An example for us, he does not rebuke them. He does not bring out the fact that everything they're saying is a lie. He makes them a feast. <laughs> he says, great, I'm happy to have this oath with you because I don't intend you any harm at all. I, I would that every one of you had the same blessings that God, he, I don't know that he said that, doesn't say it here, but I know how someone who is saved feels. He'd want them all to be saved. He'd want them all to be delivered from the famine in which they find, and for them all to worship the true and living God. He makes them a feast, and they ate, and they drank, and they rose up in the morning, and they went their way in peace. And that very day, after they had left, it says Isaac's servants who had been digging the well came, and they told him concerning that well that they had digged, we have found water. <laughs> See how the Lord blesses? And he blesses good behavior. Not just what we do with our hands, but how we think in our heart. You know, because that's how he sees us and judges us, is what's within us. Now, always ask yourself, is that what's in me? And again, he named the well. He called it Sheba. And so the city is called Beersheba, unto this day. There's a city that was built up around this wonderful well that came when neighbors got together and made a covenant of peace in the sight of God and peace prevailed. Oh, that it would happen. You know, we have a nation that they say is plunging itself towards civil war. And I can believe it because in my flesh, I, I have very strong opinions about uh, the other side of this conflict, the ones that are against God and against peace and against their own welfare and the destruction of things done by former generations. And, and I wanted to stop, but I would make peace with any one of them that would want to. And I don't think it's in me to go out and start killing them just because I disagree with them. I think we need to be peaceable with all people. And that's the message. God bless you with his peace.
Goodbye.